Hello friends, let's talk about personal safety. But first, let's talk about priorities. It's easy to fall into this dichotomous thinking during an escalated situation where safety is a trade-off. If you prioritize your safety, then you are sacrificing the safety of your team or of the escalated person. And there are situations where this is the case, but those are primarily cases where the situation has escalated to such a degree that physical intervention becomes necessary to preserve someone's safety. As always, de-escalation is about shaping the situation in order to shape behavior, not the other way around. So we want to create circumstances that improve the safety of everyone involved. If I'm prioritizing safety because I don't have backup available to me or because my escalated person has had physically violent outbursts or because I'm not confident in my read of their behavior for whatever reason, then I might need to sacrifice some genuinely good de-escalation tools like sympathetic touch. But this doesn't mean that I'm automatically gonna be doing this de-escalation from a bulletproof booth with a megaphone, you know? These qualities aren't binary. They're a series of sliding scales. So I might keep more distance than I usually would, or I might keep my language a bit more formal to put more psychological distance between us and try to create an authority relationship. But because de-escalation is very, very personal, I'm going to create the minimum distance necessary to preserve my safety, because the more my safety meter goes up, the lower my empathetic listening meter goes until the situation changes. I bring this up because the more escalated a situation gets, the harder and harder it gets to see those nuances in a situation. It's important to be proactively considering the gray areas to keep your options open and help prevent yourself from escalating. So there's two kinds of personal safety that we're concerned about in an escalated situation. First of all, physical safety. Starting with the most obvious thing, spacing. In general, the more escalated a person is, the more distance you want because this will give you time and options if things escalate to physical violence. However, this is not true for all the driving emotions that feed escalation. I should talk more about that sometime. As things escalate, in general, we do want to be further away from the escalated person, but we do this knowing that we are limiting our ability to be empathetic. So we have to weigh how likely we think this person is to become physically violent against how successful we think verbal intervention is going to be. If I'm de-escalating someone that I've known for a long time, and I know that they don't generally physically lash out in anger, then I might be comfortable staying close to them so that I can use sympathetic touch and keep a level of conversational intimacy by keeping my voice low and even to put a ceiling on how escalated they can get while keeping their generally reasonable presentation. But if this is someone who has a history of physically lashing out when they're escalated, like if I know that they uh, throw things or punch walls or invade my personal space or get really pointy and pushy, then it's less likely that I'm going to remain physically safe if I stay close. I might instead become a target, a focus for that escalation, and that's not great. So this is a balancing act that requires practice to be good at, and a good debrief can help you improve there. So let's make things more complicated. Why not? Posture is the topic of next week's video, so uh, for now I'm gonna mention it, I'm gonna give some bullet points, and then I'm gonna blow past it. A good de-escalation posture is about remaining non-threatening. Remember that someone who's escalated or escalating is losing their ability to think and behave rationally, and they're losing it fast. So we need to make sure that our posture isn't going to be read by the lizard brain as aggressive or threatening. This means that we keep our shoulders and hips slightly tilted away from square and keep our hands in front of us and we keep them as open and broad as possible. We maintain conversational eye contact, which means we meet their eyes about two thirds of the time. Facial expressions stay neutral to slightly sad or concerned, but not too much because we don't want to be pitying. Our feet stay planted, weight evenly distributed both between the feet and between the front and the back of the foot. This will give us a visual air of solidity that will help a lot with our rapport. Shoulders stay down, neck slightly forward, head tilted down and to one side, biceps relaxed, core relaxed, knees slightly bent. Was that a lot? Yes. Does it matter? Yes, I ain't here to waste your time. The goal is to communicate interest, empathetic concern, and very importantly, inexorability. We aren't starting a fight, but we won't be moved either. Moving on. And if you have any questions or want anything clarified or expanded upon, hit me up in the comments. Now, why do we care about inexorability? Well, that's because it's an expert segue into maintaining our mental safety. One of the hazards of de-escalating, especially of de-escalating someone you know well or with whom you sincerely empathize, which ideally is everyone, but you know, uh, and ain't nobody perfect, is that we tend to drift away from our goals and towards theirs without realizing it. Usually we do want to share the same goal with the escalated person, but we want to knowingly be on their side rather than having been manipulated to be there. Good teaming does a lot to keep us on the right track. 
teaming, I promise it's coming. So even with someone we know well, when we're de-escalating, we want to keep a certain amount of distance. Once the goal for the de-escalation is set, we can't budge from that goal unless we get new information that makes that goal not a good one. So again, there's this balancing act where we want to have solid goals for the de-escalation and they need to be achievable. Our knowledge of what is reasonably achievable might change and we need to be receptive to that, but we can't allow ourselves to be manipulated into moving to a non-productive goal. I've mentioned before how a willingness to de-escalate can be taken advantage of by bad actors if we're not careful, and empathy is such an important part of de-escalation and also easy to manipulate by someone with the inclination. When we're in a de-escalation conversation with someone we don't know or don't know very well, then it's almost certainly a good idea to set a goal and stick to it no matter what. This is in large part because the escalations that uh, we're likely to experience with a stranger are likely to be relatively shallow. Things like crowding in the bank line or someone having a loud conversation on speakerphone on the bus. These aren't interpersonal conflicts so much as they are a uh, blatant disregard for social mores and they can be de-escalated on the surface level pretty simply by initiating the options consequences sequence. On the other hand, when your partner comes home from work extremely agitated because they feel like a faceless cog in an uncaring machine that eats their time and offers insufficient recompense, uh, or a fundamental mismatch in values like how your best friend keeps calling their partner the old ball and chain, and you brought up before how that has big boomer energy and they're all, oh, it's just a joke, lighten up. Because we have a pre-existing emotional investment in this person that is outside the immediate de-escalation, we are susceptible to manipulation, and in some cases, gaslighting. Now, if you hang out a lot on the internet, like I do, uh, and especially on Reddit, uh, like I do, and if you have an unquenchable thirst for other people's drama, like I do, then you've probably heard the term gaslighting used and misused. So I want to make sure that we're on the same page here. Gaslighting is when a person attempts to alter another person's perception of reality. It is not simply telling lies. A lie is, I never said that. Gaslighting is, I never said that. You must have misheard me. There's a Venn diagram here where some lies are gaslighting and some acts of gaslighting are lies, but it's not perfect overlap. One easy to identify thing that tends to push a lie into gaslighting territory is moving it from an I statement to a you statement. This is something that everyone is vulnerable to, and given the nature of de-escalation, de-escalators make themselves very open to being gaslit. Uh, one time I asked the escalated person who was venting about a coworker and had strayed into personal attacks, calling them lazy. Uh, I asked them if they were comfortable portraying their coworker in such a negative light to people who would never meet them. My goal was to point out that they were no longer venting for catharsis, but were instead attacking someone who was not there to defend themselves and to uh, redirect that energy inwards. In response, they told me that I was telling them how to feel. Be alert for internal feelings of confusion or stress. During a de-escalation, a lot of things can be said and a lot of things can happen very quickly. It's easy to lose track of those little throwaway comments or side remarks. But if those remarks generate a gut feeling that something isn't right here, then that needs to be listened to. The appropriate course of action in the case of gaslighting is to disengage. As always, the disengagement may be temporary and it may be permanent and either may be appropriate based on the particulars of the situation. Someone who gaslights is not willing to be de-escalated, so don't waste your time on them. If you must remain engaged with them, as enforcement folks generally have to uh, until a situation is appropriately resolved, then now is the time to establish consequences or to enforce consequences that have been previously established. If that's not viable, then you become a robot and all inputs receive the same output, which is the blandest, most flat response you can think of at the time until such time as you can disengage safely and responsibly. Since you can't de-escalate, the next best thing to do is to make sure that things won't continue to escalate. Emotional involvement is always escalation, and if you are escalating, then you cannot be a good de-escalator, and disengagement is the right call. Keep careful tabs on your emotional state, use a personal debrief to get a clearer look at what happened and the effects that the de-escalation had on you, and keep that in mind going forward. Part of keeping yourself safe is making sure that you are as resilient as possible to the genuine emotional hardships that de-escalation can bring. Make sure that you have someone or several someones to, to vent to if you need it. Make sure that you can take time for yourself to decompress. Don't be afraid to reach out to someone else who's familiar with de-escalation, if only to confirm that you didn't do anything wrong, or perhaps to get some ideas about what to do better. De-escalation is a team sport, and sometimes your team needs to support you. That's not failure, that's life. What do you think? Did I miss anything about personal safety and de-escalation? 
How do you protect yourself in an escalated situation? Is it better to maintain distance to prevent harm or to be as empathetic as possible and correct harms only once and if they occur? Put your stories, additions, or corrections in the comments. Be smart, stay safe, bye.